So hello, everybody. Uh, good morning and happy Pi Day for all of you who are celebrating that. Um, and this is the Salmon Diet, upstreaming device drivers as a form of optimization. And I'm Gilad Ben Youssef. So I, I thought I'd say a few words about who am I and what am I doing. Uh, I'm the maintainer of a device driver of the ARM Trust Zone CryptoCell uh, piece of IP. I'll say a few words about that. Uh, I also dabble with general Linux kernel cryptography and uh, security uh, to give a taste of the kind of thing I do. I submitted a patch set to introduce the Chinese SM4 crypto algorithm to the kernel lately. Uh, I've been working on various forums in and around the Linux kernel and other open source projects for quite a while. Uh, enough that you can see all the white hairs. Um, Co-offered building embedded Linux system, the second edition. Uh, and I've done a few other stuff uh, that you can see here. So yesterday, uh, I sort of frolicked around the hotel and uh, found out, uh, to my uh, amusement, that uh, we were actually on Salmon Street, which is kind of makes sense. Uh, because as I've been told, uh, Portland or Oregon people really, really like the salmon, which uh, is logical. You can see here a, a picture taken at Williamette Falls, which I gather is not too far away, of uh, salmon leaping upstream, because this is what salmons do. But it appears that uh, leaping upstream is not unique just for salmons. It also happened when the Linux kernel and the Linux kernel mailing list. Uh, and leaping upstream for device driver and device driver um, writers is when you have some piece of code, a device driver in my case, that uh, is already written uh, and you wish to submit it to the Linux kernel. Um, but as these things often uh, happen, um, said piece of code is not necessarily, at least in the beginning of this process, in the form that is acceptable to the Linux kernel community. And therefore, there's a process uh, of getting that fixed uh, in order to be able to, that piece of code to be formally accepted into the Linux kernel. And that process is uh, called the staging tree. Basically, uh, sort of the Linux kernel community um, accept your code on probation uh, on the condition that you work with the community to get that fixed. And when all the things that needs fixing in the eyes of the community are fixed, uh, the code can mature into the, the main kernel tree. Now, as I've said before, I have actually have been working in and around Linux for quite some time. I've submitted patches. I, I did change in the kernel. But I never went to this process until one year ago, uh, when I was hired by ARM to handle the ARM Trust Zone uh, CryptoCell device driver. Uh, the, the ARM Trust Zone CryptoCell device of a, or ARM Trust Zone CryptoCell itself, it's, it's a piece of hardware basically, or designed for hardware, or IP, as they call that, started its life in some other company. Um, called Discretics originally, then Sansa, which Arm bought. And when Arm bought that uh, company, uh, it discovered that it does have a device driver, but it was out of tree. And when Arm bought the company, it was decided to do the right thing and upstream the damn thing, uh, which is where I came in. I got hired to do that. Now, before we go into the specifics and what's happened there and some of the interesting uh, things that I learned along the way and I hope to share with you. I thought I'd say a few words about what the hell is ARM Trust Zone CryptoCell. Um, because I'm not a marketing guy, I went to the marketing department and asked them to get some slides that explain what it is and what does it do. Um, unfortunately, and they, got, they gave me this slide, unfortunately, uh, I thought I knew what that piece of IP does. But after reading the description that the marketing department gave me, I was not sure, so sure anymore. So, <laughs> so, so I decided that that is not helpful and, and write my own Reader Digest version. Uh, 
So basically, the ARM trusts on CryptoCell, it's, it's a hardware block, which ARM designs and people implement, that handle a lot of aspects of system security. So it provides cryptographic algorithm, but also a root of trust, a secure boot, secure debug. Basically, it's a block of uh, hardware that does security. It goes inside the system of the chip. It's not part of the core, but it is part of the system of the chip. And it's a both trusted and untrusted world. For those of you who are familiar with ARM Trust Zone, there's some distinction there. And that's basically all you need to know for the purpose of this presentation. So when I got hired, I you know, took the, the driver of the thing. Uh, and it should be noted that by this time, you know, there was an existing device driver. It was working. It was being used in the field by numerous customers and on a lot of devices. So it, it was really not a case of something new and untested. Uh, and I started the work to uh, get it upstream via the staging tree. So this is sort of the uh, original uh, commit that I send. Actually, I think I'm lying. I think it's the second one. I botched the first one. You know, I sent it, but it was, I didn't really know how to do it. I, I sent an email with uh, a link to the Git repository because I figured it's a big driver. I'm not going to pull all 7,000 lines of it in the mailing list, but I was told, no, this is not the way to do it. You have to break it down. So it's a process. It's an interesting process. Um, the thing about this is that, you know, there's this device driver. It's a bunch of code. It is actually working. And the people working on it have done a good job in the sense, you know, this is something critical that people depend on. Uh, but then again, it is open source because it, is, it was licensed under the GPL even before. But it's not necessarily that the people who wrote it thought about somebody else taking a look at it. And of course, when you go through the process of upstream, that is exactly what happens. And I found this little meme that explains how that made me feel, right? Uh, <laughs> you have all this stuff in, in the driver that people put in there. It's, you know, it's working, but it's maybe not very nice on the eyes. OK, so I started this process of upstreaming. And, uh, a big part of the process is getting the feedback from the kernel community for the mentor. OK, you're not using this uh, API correctly, and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, changes um, to places where things were not being done exactly as they should. Um, that was actually a rather small part of the process, a very important one, but a small one. A huge part of my time has been spent uh, with a personal enemy of mine called Checkpatch. For those of you not familiar with this creature, uh, it's basically a script. It lives in the Linux kernel, and you're supposed to run it on your patches or code, and it lets you know where you screwed up. Uh, sometimes big screw up, but usually things like, oh, you did not match the alignment of the parentheses and so on, or you forgot some trailing white space. And it's a really helpful tool when you, know, you make this change to the kernel and, and you know, want it to be accepted and go through the standard. But uh, in this particular mode of operation where you have this huge chunk of pre-existing code that uh, I'm only starting to get familiar with, and none of it, none of it is written according to the kernel code style, and you run it on, you, know, you run check patch on the code, well, it's you know, your own version of hell. Right, uh, the, you get this huge output of a bazillion lines of, uh, oh, you missed a space there, and stuff like that. What, what can you do? Uh, there's a reason why the kernel called this style exists. Uh, and like it or not, this is what I needed to do. So I start doing that. Uh, so side by side with uh, the bigger issue and adv advices that I got from uh, the mentors, and check patch, I you know, started working, addressing the issues, learning a little bit about both the driver, which was new to me, and the APIs in the kernel it was using. Uh, and little by little, it got better, uh, in the sense that it adheres better to the Linux kernel coding style, and the code looked better, and so on. Uh, and this, I guess, is a natural process. But at some point in time, I began to notice a strange pattern. Okay? I was making these changes. And mind you, these changes were not adding features. 
not subtracting features, but just you know, changing you know, this space versus that, or using that API versus this, and making the logical changes that uh, grow forth from this. So uh, while there was a general expectation that the, the code will get better, um, what I did not expect and I found surprising is that this pattern emerged that the line, the count of the line of code in a driver kept falling. So each commit set that I would send for review had more lines deleted than lines added. And in the beginning, um, you know, that made me uh, rather pleased. You know, uh, when you're deleting stuff, it's usually a good sign for code quality. But at some point, you know, I'm not, a, this is not something random. It keeps happening more and more and more. Sometimes there's like a huge drop when I change something. And the conclusion of this process from where I started until it ended was that I actually deleted 30% of the line count of the driver. And it still kept doing the exact same thing. Now, this is good, right? This is a good thing, but it is also surprising, right? Because think about it, what that means. That means that 30% of the code of the driver, as it was previously written, didn't do anything, OK? Uh, they were useless. Or actually, they were worse than useless. Because when you have code that you can remove and the code still does the same thing, uh, you just have room for more bugs, right? And, and this is a security critical part of the system. It handles stuff like book of trust and encryption keys and so on. It's really not good to have auxiliary code in there. So this, this got me intrigued. And I asked myself, well, what went on there? How, how was I able to cut this 30% of the code that did nothing? What, what was the reason we had 30% of the code that was useless? And, and what was it that that process of upstreaming made me do? And what can we learn from it? And as you can expect from these kind of things, uh, there's no one cause, right? I've actually been able to identify, uh, I think it's seven different um, causes or reason. Um, and you can look at it both ways, either for adding useless code or for the uh, upstreaming process to remove bad code. Um, so basically, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to share with you uh, what kind of patterns were revealed to me as I went through this upstreaming process and what I learned from it. Uh, some of them are rather mundane and not surprising. Uh, some of them, I don't know, maybe uh, can be learned a little bit. We can, we can learn something interesting from looking at it. So let's get started. So the first thing that was really obvious is something which I chose to dub reinventing the wheel. Now, I know that the font is way too small for you to see, and that is fine because the detail here don't matter all that much. What you're seeing here is an original function, an SSI buffer manager and copy scatalyst portion, uh, which in the end, after all the changes, uh, continued to do the exact thing, same thing and now looks like this. So the name changed, but also you can see it kind of shrunk. And you, know, you can ask yourself, well, what happened here? And the answer is, so the major thing that this function was doing was actually replicating a certain API that already existed in the kernel. And when you express, it was not doing it exactly the same way, but you can sort of massage it. You know, you can see change the parameter a little bit and, and compound something so that you can express the old function in the terms in your new function with a little wrapper. And that got that big function down into this one. And this in itself is not a surprising thing, but the question that this raises is, well, how can I identify this pattern, either when I'm writing the code or when I'm reviewing code for a streaming? And it turns out there's some really easy way, I think, to think about this. Ask yourself the following question. What does this code do? Obviously, you need to do what it does, right? Uh, and ask yourself, is what I'm doing here, is the problem that I'm trying to solve here, is something which is unique to my specific case, to my specific holder, to my specific driver, or it's something which is common, that other driver in the same system, for example, have the same uh, problem to deal with, the same issue. 
And if so, ask yourself, well, what are these guys doing, right? Because if they're doing something and it's the same problem, probably I can do the same. Uh, and this methodical process, when you read code or write code, whatever the case may be, of asking yourself, is this problem unique to me? And if it isn't, go find out, find out what the other users or the other uh, code which has the same issue is doing. And two things can happen. Okay, most of the time, you will find out that there is one or more set of API which you could just use uh, and be done with it. And sometimes, and that happened to me as well, uh, you will find that there's similar spirited code replicated in a lot of places, and then uh, you, if you want to be a good kernel citizen, uh, get the extra pleasure of writing that new API that expresses that and changes all these places to do that. And if you follow this process, it actually deletes uh, quite a big chunk um, of your driver because your driver probably lives in sub subsystem and probably that a lot of the issues that your driver is dealing with are the same across the whole subsystem. So this is the reinventing the wheel pattern. Don't do it. Another thing which had a great impact once you know, I look at it, is the whole issue of backwards compatibility. And there's a lot of jokes about backwards compatibility. You know, backwards compatibility is compatibility down backwards, or this quote from some uh, down metric in Microsoft, if you're backwards compatible, you're really backwards, and so on. Uh, how does this come to play? So in my specific case, it meant that the driver that, remember, lived as an outer tree project on the side had a whole bunch of these if defs, right? It was targeting a certain uh, version of the kernel, but it had if defs for the older version. Uh, so obviously, if you go and just delete those, things get simpler and smaller. But this does not stop here. I mean, this code is here because we needed backwards compatibility, because sadly, not all our customers are necessarily on the, the bleeding edge. So just deleting this uh, is really not a good solution. I mean, so that leads to the question, how does one uh, handle uh, backwards compatibility with older kernel when you have a piece of hardware that you need to support uh, across many kernel versions? And it turns out this is actually tied to something else, uh, which seems, uh, seems like a different issue, but is actually related, and that is how do you treat a different version of the same hardware. And I don't know if this is a general pattern, although I think it is. This is what we were doing, right? We had this pattern of, say, a certain version of the hardware. Here it's CCRE, Crypto Cell RE 7.12. So we had some version of the driver, 1.1 in this case. Uh, and it supported kernel 3.18 and 4.9 right, with these if defs. And as development progresses, uh, the driver got a new version and a new version. And at some point in time, maybe they added a new kernel version that was supported. And some point in time, when a new project was started in this basically a hardware company, they sort of replicated the same logic that guided the hardware development, that is, just like the hardware design was replicated, right, and started anew to form CCRE 713, they did the same thing with the driver. They basically forked it, right? So uh, version, say, 1.2 of the CCRE 712 became version 1.0. It started out as the same code base of CCRE 713, just with the small adjustment to support 713. Uh, and maybe there was a change in kernel version. And that continued onwards. Uh, and of course, it is does not stop here because you have more version of products and more version of, of the kernel you wish to support. And that gave rise to two things. A, those if defs in the code, and B, uh, that you now have several very, very similar, but not the same, not compatible versions of the driver to support version of the hardware. Um, this is the way things worked. And I would maybe call it a hard liquor way of managing stuff because you need hard liquor to uh, handle all this complexity. Just think about 
What happens if there's some issue in one of the in, in, discovered in one of the versions? You need to find out now if it affects all the others and make the necessary changes. So to get over this, what we ended up doing, and actually still in the process of doing, was change this on its head, okay? Uh, and move to the, back to the future way of handling things. And in the back of the future way of handling things, we're doing things different. We have the upstream kernel version, and of course, over time, we add more features or change bug and so on with the new kernel version. Uh, so 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 that goes in uh, newer and newer kernel version. And in them, we add support for new product revision. So the same driver now support all the products incrementally. And that means that when some bug is found, we don't need to ask the question of, OK, which other product line does this affect? So this is very convenient. But it does leave the question, OK, but what about the backwards compatibility? What about backports? So it turns out, and this still there is proof, at least internally in our organization, but I suspect it will prove itself, that it's way easier to take the uh, latest version in the latest kernel in the upstream and backport that to a known stable kernel uh, than do it the other way around. And there is even a project with significant infrastructure, well, the Backports project, that helps you do that. Okay? They have a lot of mechanics, if you will, a framework to do this. Now think about what that means, not necessarily in the eyes of an engineer, but more as a product manager from the business side. It means that you always support all the versions of the, same, of the products, of the same driver for a customer that wants to switch to a new revision of the hardware. It's very easy. It's using the same driver, so everything works as the same. Uh, a bug that is found in a version is automatically, obviously, fixed across all the version of the product. And if you're doing it right, if you're using infrastructure for at least semi-automatic backporting, that means that when a customer comes and say, well, it's really great that you're on the bleeding edge 4.17. I'm really still on 4.9 or 4.14 or whatever, uh, you have an automated process. You can practically click a button and get a version that suits him. Now, you still have to verify that, right? You still have to go through QA or whatever. But uh, at least you took out from the equation the engineering effort to do the backboard, right? If you put that into the machinery of your integration, that works really, really well. And this way of doing things allowed us to remove all the backport support, all these if-ifs that we saw. And it turns out that even after adding the support for all the previous version that we wanted to support of the product, we still got a significant drop of line counts. And if you want to think of it from a different perspective, if you look at the total line of, count, of, line of code that we needed to support across all the versions, that significantly reduced itself. Because before, we have several versions of slightly similar, the same driver for different versions of the hub, and now we have just one. And of course, most of it is exactly the same. So backwards compatibility uh, is an, was another source of uh, code that we found out that we can remove and actually get things better. Moving forward. Uh, there are a lot of places where the programmers were simply using the wrong API. And, and this is really a great example. So the original driver had this CSFS interface to allow basically low-level debugging or picking into some registers to find out what goes on and tracing of events in the driver, which were really not of interest to almost any of the users. It was really for the development and debugging. And it was originally, as I said, developed with CSFS. Now, CSFS, as the documentation says, is the file system for exporting kernel object, whatever that means. Uh, and it provides a mean to export kernel data structure, their attribute, and the linkage between them to user space. So this is, you know, if, if, if you're an external developer, not necessarily one that is uh, 
in tune with the kernel community way of doing things, you read this and say, okay, so makes sense. This looks like a good interface to use in order to push my debug levers or whatever. Uh, but actually, it's really wrong, the wrong one. This is not the one you want to use. For the kind of things that I describe, basically debug uh, tracing, there's actually debug FS, uh, which, as the computation says, exists as a simple way for kernel developers to make information available for user space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the difference may seem, I don't know, semiotic, but in the end of the day, when we took the line count of implementing pretty much the same thing uh, over SysFS and then, and then did it over DebugFS, lo and behold, we cut down almost four times uh, the line of code, okay? Because the person who designed DebugFS, or at least wrote the code for it, I'm not sure it was designed, um, was trying to do something very specific, right, to help debug um, provide like a, a debug window into a, a driver or a piece of code. And therefore, they had infrastructure that exactly matched what we needed to do, and we didn't need to write it. Uh, now, I'm just, in the sake of honesty, the whole picture should be mentioned that some of the functionality we can just remove because it basically uh, also replicated perf, okay, uh, or ftrace, depending on what you want to know. But again, the big change was due for, to just using the right API. So lesson number three, use the right API. Okay, the, the fact that you could do something with a certain API does not necessarily mean it's the right one. Sometimes there are several API that may fit and it's worth the time of the effort to ask the question which one of them is the best. Moving along. Um, what I'd like to call duct tape engineering, <laughs> which is, um, it goes like this. This is best described as an example. So we had a device driver that um, supported some asynchronic hardware that worked with DMA and so forth uh, to handle crypto operation. Now, it turns out that the Linux kernel actually have two sort of flavors of API to ask for cryptographic operation. The asynchronous one, which we, uh, was, was very natural or native for us to support, and a synchronous one, which is actually meant for uh, basically software that runs on the CPU, which may or may not use specialized instruction, but it's for stuff that is actually inherent to stuff that is in the core, that actually has access to the TLB and the MMU of the core. The thing is, there is a lot of security-oriented software on models in the kernel, such as the MVRT, for example, uh, that was written to use the synchronous API. And we can go into a whole uh, article of asking yourself, why is that? And that is actually a presentation by itself. Uh, basically, the short answer is because the asynchronic API and the most common way of using it was uh, too complicated and actually uh, offered an upstream a set of patches to fix that, but that is the side point. The point is that before that I came in, the way that uh, our driver or the previous developer dealt with that was saying the following thing. So there's a bunch of software in the kernel that actually uses cryptographic uh, algorithm that we can accelerate, but it's using the synchronous API, not the asynchronous one. So obviously the right thing to do for us would be to uh, support also the synchronous API, which may sound like it makes sense if you don't go into the details, but the reality is that if you uh, try to take um, DMA using off-core piece of hardware and make it uh, behave or uh, expose itself as a totally synchronic uh, API which was born or designed um, for basically a piece of software on the CPU and have access to the MMU, what you get is uh, damn ugly. <laughs> okay, really, really ugly and unstable. And there is an obvious solution to the same problem, which is much, much simpler and require much, much less code inside the driver. And that is, go to the Inverity 
ask the question, why is it using the synchronous API? And when you find out that the answer is not a really good reason, just change it. Okay, this is the glory of open source. Don't try, and this is a big one, don't try to fix in your device driver stuff that is broken or can be optimized elsewhere. Because when you do, your device driver just expands ridiculously. Use the source, look, right? Uh, you have that access to just go and fix what needs to fix in the other side. And it turns out that the amount of code needed to actually fix DM Verity was very small. The amount of effort was very small. And that allowed us to cut down a huge amount of code, which was also buggy, from the device driver itself. OK, so avoid duct tape engineering. Fix stuff the right way. Uh, use the, 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 the fact that Linux is an open source pr uh, platform, and you don't need uh, to try to work around the problem. Just fix the problem. Much easier. Next item on the list. Uh, I'm not sure it's a general one, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Uh, I call it micro gymnastics. I, I'm not sure why. Actually, I, I have a clue. Okay, I think it came about because uh, of this horrible idea called uh, HAL or PAL, or hardware abstraction layer, or platform abstraction layer. There's this idea that if you write a device driver that maybe someday someone will want to use on some different platform, the right way is to put a bunch of code that hides away, as if it, that is actually possible, the specifics of the interface to the hardware on the software, and then code above that. Um, as you can tell, I'm not very fond of the idea. Uh, these abstractions tend to be very leaky. What usually ends up is that nobody is actually using the name driver on other uh, operating system, and if they do, they're using some forked off version that is very different, but you still get stuck with all those mechanics of those hardware abstraction layer. They are actually have a great effect on performance. Even worse than that, even worse than that, they have a huge effect on the design of your driver, because when you're trying to code to this, uh, to, to serve a couple of operating systems or platforms, you have to code to the law of SCOMIS denominator. That's really bad. Uh, so in our specific case, the actual HAL-PAL concept was not really there anymore. The people who programmed this were smart enough to figure out it doesn't really work and remove it. The driver was only supporting Linux. But yet, uh, we had this legacy of trying to base something um, on this no longer existing interface, and that manifests itself by having stuff like just go and read uh, a register uh, looking like this above, right? It's this macro that has the name of the register. And there was this really, um, I guess I'll be polite and say rich set of macros, calling macros that wrap it. And I'm sure there was a reason at some point in time for making all this, maybe not a good one, but it certainly no longer existed uh, when I took over the driver. So I was able to turn all that crap into just this, okay? Just a simple static inline with a simple macro just to make it so I don't have to write um, a big define that was auto-generated anywhere and can just use the name. Uh, so again, it is worth, when you write code and when you review other people's code, it is worth looking into things. And if you start to see too much Macro wrappers, it's, it's a good idea to stop and ask yourself, is this really clear? Is this really serving a purpose? Uh, because this is not maintainable, but this is, okay? And again, that cut a few more lines of code. Uh, that's a favorite of mine. That's actually quite surprising. Zombie code, okay? You would think that there will not be too much of code inside a device driver that somebody maintains that nobody's actually using anymore and maybe never used. Uh, but as, as we've heard before in one of the keynotes, 
uh, what is true for the bigger Linux is certainly true all for, for my small device driver. There was huge amount of code that was never used. Now, part of this was never used at all ever uh, because it was some structures which, which auto-generated from description of registers that we got from the, you know, the hardware guys and so on, but we never actually used. Um, some of it got to be unused when we moved from uh, proprietary or our specific mechanism to general kernel mechanism, uh, such for stuff like tracing, for example, which made some of the code unneeded. Um, and some of this, of that, I'm, I'm just not sure, right? It, there was just some code that we removed, and when we started to unravel what that code needed and start deleting all the code that uh, was no longer needed because we made something work a little bit different, uh, we just began to see that we can delete a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, you can see that uh, it's worth a while if you had an ongoing project, and certainly if you do an upstream work, to go over the code and ask yourself, is somebody actually using this? And Git grep is really a good friend in this, uh, in this endeavor. Uh, because remember, code which is not there, or data structure which are not there, cannot be used against you, right? They cannot hold bugs. Uh, and this even have a new and frightening new meaning in the brave new world of Spectre, if you think about that. Okay, code that is never called can still be speculatively executed with Spectre variant 2. So it's a really bad idea to leave out code there, especially one that you, is not maintained because you know it's not getting called. Um, maybe one example of this is worth um, uh, focusing into. Uh, some of it was not actually called, but as I said, definition that got auto-generated from some hardware register description files. And, and we see that a lot, I think, in the kernel, right? There's this huge H file with description of the registers. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we should just um, kill all of them and leave just the one that we're using. But, you know, maybe it's worthwhile to ask the question, does it really add something if we have, you know, this H file of 32,000 or whatever register definition and the driver only uses 10? I, I don't know. It's... It's a good question. I'm, I'm, I, I'm quite very much aware that these are auto-generated in a lot of cases. But when you want to debug something, do you really need all that crap? Is it helpful? Uh, so in our case, we left some of the definitions and removed others according to specific, uh, let's say, hardware blocks or pattern of usage that made sense to us. You know? In some cases, we took the whole auto-generated file, we left it there. Some cases, we said, you know what? Uh, we really will uh, we'll never be using any of the other you know, registers and so on there for a very specific purpose. It's not relevant. If we will need them, we'll add them later again. And that helped us drop even more code. The last one is kind of mundane. I mean, it's the kind of thing you learn when you first start to program, you know, programming one of one, don't repeat yourself. You have two functions, they're basically doing the same thing, but maybe with a small change. So don't write the whole code again. Just write one single function and do a wrapper and so on. Uh, there were not a lot of this, but there was some. Uh, and that was not because the previous program were necessarily bad. It's just that when you have a large enough code base, and enough engineers working on it, sometimes in different um, times, uh, they're not necessarily aware of all the things that are happening out of place of the driver. But uh, one of the opportunities that presented itself when we looked in the whole driver and did this work of upstreaming was to locate these places where uh, something slipped by and we had really common functionality that can be brought into a single function. Um, and quite interesting, some of it has been sort of hidden by the other changes, right? So the code may, was maybe more complex, so we are using all this macro gymnastics, so it's not obvious that it was actually doing the same thing. But once we went through some of the simplification mo motion, it then became clear that it actually is doing the same thing. So there is this uh, acceleration effect, right? Nonlinear effect that when you uh, tidy something up, it sort of helps you see the other opportunities for simplification and optimization. OK, 
Okay. So those were the, you know, the things that I learned uh, that actually made um, the upstream drivers so much better. And we, we got to a happy end, right? Really, I think this morning I saw uh, Greg Kuo Hartman uh, email hacking this change that removed the staging copy because the crypto uh, tree uh, accepted formally the device driver. Um, and it took something like a year. Okay, it's, it's, it's a question of resource investment, really. But I think it's really worth asking, what did we get from this? Okay, so I deleted a bunch of lines of code. But really, that driver got better. And I don't mean better in the sense that, okay, it performs now one nanosecond faster, some a obscure AES operation. No, not that kind of better. I'm talking about better of being higher quality. Okay, so it's faster time to market to make a new revision for a new hardware revision. It's more secure because I have less code and it's much easier for me to go over it and make sure I didn't do a mistake and for others to do the same. Uh, it's higher quality code that our customer that use these things in critical parts of the system. This stuff is what makes sure um, it, it's a security critical component. So it's really important in the business down, top line sense, uh, got better. And we got that benefit by doing upstreaming. And this is something important to remember, okay? Uh, yes, we're starting doing this because it's the right thing, and this is standard operating procedure, if possible, in how to do the right thing in this regard. Not always easy or possible, but when it is possible. And we all knew it's the right thing and we'll make the code better, but we really got um, the attention of a huge com community, some of them world expert in what they're doing, working with us, helping this code um, be better. That's completely untrivial, and I think it's also a good opportunity to say thank you to these guys, not all of them are here. I took this mostly out of just the Git log of the changes that went in into this driver. Now, think about it for a second, okay? It's an obscure piece of hardware. I mean, it's been used by a bazillion devices, but you know, most people don't have access to it or don't think about it, although some of you may even run this on their phones, they are not aware. Uh, but we got all these people to contribute time and effort, some of them, uh, you know, Greg Cole Hartman, David Miller, Herbert Sue and, and, and so on, uh, to give us critical input that made this driver better in the business sense. That certainly is worthwhile. And it wasn't, didn't take that long. It's one engineer, me, working on this for one year, uh, taking into account that this is not the only thing I was working on, and uh, this was new code to me. Okay? So it wasn't that difficult. The benefit was huge. And I really owe a depth of gratitude to all these guys. So. Thank you if you're seeing the video. Uh, and there's basically uh, two things before uh, I will let you ask questions should you have them. Uh, one of them is a tradition I did not start, but uh, I'm happy to continue, and that is to take a speaker selfie with all of you. So if one of you don't want to get pic uh, in the picture, this is a good time to duck. Um, and one last thing before questions is, as it says, just don't worry about it. Keep calm and upstream on. It's really, really worth the effort. You learn a lot. The code gets better. Um, I know it's hard to convince sometimes management, so hopefully show them this presentation. I'm sure they're smart people and will understand. Questions? Wow, I was really that clear. Excellent. <laughs> All right then. Yes. Is there any place where you think the community led you astray or um, took you in directions you didn't want to go with the code? Well, it's a good question. Uh, it certainly felt that way a couple of times. Um, but 
Oh, okay, I, I repeat the question. The question was, were there a situation where I felt that the community led me astray or you know, well, did not work with me? Uh, so it's a good question. I think it felt that way a couple of times. Okay? Um, for, I'll give a concrete example, um, which I think will help explain my, um, my answer better. Just at the beginning, you know, I have this huge drive, 7,000 lines of code, which I wanted you know, to submit for review. And um, I was kind of scratching my head how to do it. Of course, you can make a patch, like a big 17,000 lines patch and submit that. That didn't seem, you know, sending that on a main list. So I tried putting it on you know, a Git repository and, and sending a link, and we still know. You need to break it down into committable, or, you know, uh, separate committable atomic um, parts of the driver so we can review that. So on one hand, the logic of that made total sense. They want to review it, they can look at this thing. On the other hand, this is a huge driver that already exists. How do you tear it apart, right? It's, I did not know how to do it. At first, it was quite kind of um, frustrating. Um, but there's one thing that really kept uh, in the back of my mind for all this process, and that is that I'm really uh, going to a bunch of uh, world experts or just random people and basically asking them to invest time in helping me. So if they ask me to do something, I need to, to do this, I feel, even if it does not seem reasonable and the point. And when I started thinking about this, I realized that what they're asking were not uh, that difficult to do once you, you know, uh, relieved yourself of the option of not doing this, let's say. Uh, and, uh, and so I did that, and I actually got something in return. So, uh, and, and that is that when I you know, uh, went into the mechanics of understanding how to actually um, slice the driver into pieces, I learned something about the driver I was not aware of before, uh, how it's structured, what's the different pieces that can function together, what are not, the, the interdependencies. And I think that this is a good example because uh, what it says is that What's important is not necessarily any specific advice per se, it's the process. So even if I, at a certain point, got maybe less than actionable advices or something that, you know what, it's not that important, I think the whole process of somebody asking you, it's like a huge exercise in peer programming with some of the world you know, best minds, uh, was useful in itself. So even if somebody told me to do something which ended up being wrong, Understanding why it's wrong and being able to explain it to somebody which is a complete stranger and has no idea what my hardware is was beneficial. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Did you have any particular uh, problems with getting customers to use the driver dashboard project? Uh, or did it so, so uh, the question is did we had problems getting customers to use the the backports uh, project. Um, so my answer has two parts. First, this is something which is still ongoing, but our plan is not to let the customer use the backport uh, project, but for us, right? We use it as infrastructure. We commit to the said customers on specific version that we support. We use the backport mechanism in order to enable us to easily make the backport and deliver it to them. So there's no expectation for the customer to do it. Of course, should the customer want to use it to backport to some version which is not blessed by um, the business entity, they are welcome to do it, but that's up to them. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you.